covert ops, espionage, the team house, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. The team house welcome to episode 118 i'm jack murphy here with co-host david park tonight our guest on the show is doug london he spent 34 years as a cia case officer uh mostly deployed around the world recruiting intelligence assets on behalf of the united states he is the author of a, a recent memoir called the recruiter that i just finished reading the other day this is a really really good book it is uh, a, a great book that uh, I'm, I'm not here necessarily a salesman for uh, Doug's book, but I think with the holidays coming up, this is actually a really good book to get like family members or friends. Yourself. Who, or yourself. Um, people who are interested in the agency. Secret but, Santas. <laughs> around the office. Yeah. I, it, because it's a good introduction to what the CIA does, but it's also very much colored by Doug's personal experiences, which is what we're going to get to on today's show. So, Doug, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks so much for having me on the program. I loved your theme music. I wish I could have had that when I was spying in my day. It would have really motivated me. <laughs> it's important to have a theme song. That's right. It's like Saturday Day Morning Cartoons is the way I always thought of it. <laughs> so, Doug, why don't you, if you can, um, start off telling us a little bit about your origins uh, growing up in the Bronx and, and sort of uh, your upbringing. What, what kind of set you on the path towards service uh, with our, uh, our government? Yeah, you know, it's, it's just crazy uh, how life circumstances, um, whatever you think they are at the time, are, are sometimes gifts. And I grew up in the Bronx. My uh, parents were both working folks, they, neither of whom graduated from high school. Uh, my sister and I were actually the first ones to go to college. Uh, it was, uh, we, we kept moving neighborhoods because the Bronx was burning in the 70s, if, uh, for those of you who might remember. And literally one of the buildings I lived in as a teenager burnt to the ground. So uh, it was a challenging time to be a kid uh, in the 70s and, and to deal with the poverty and, and a lot of the, the racism that was going on among the different communities between Italians and Blacks and Irish and Puerto Ricans and such like that. And I tended to be the lone Jew uh, amongst a lot of these crowds. So I, I, I kind of tried to find a way to get along because, you know, um, I would turn out later to be a spy, not like a warrior king. So, you know, I had to depend sort of on making friends with, with everybody. I, I got lucky in terms of getting into a good high school. I got into Bronx Science, for those of you who know it. And then um, I was a bit of an underachiever in high school, but uh, to give myself the benefit of that, my dad died during that time. So I sort of took a, a self-allowed uh, leave of absence for a while. I uh, was able to get back. The, the wonderful thing about New York City schools, for those of you who know it, is at least in my day, if you pass the Regents exams, for like your subjects, they had to promote you. So uh, I, I was able to move on and I got into Manhattanville College, which is in Westchester County, which is I think where, where you're from, but yep. another part of it, more like White Plains. And which was awesome because they wanted my inner city experience to add to the environment. This had once been a famous girls college. The, the Kennedy family had sent their, their daughters and, and, and ladies there. So that was a great place to go. And uh, that's really where I started getting into foreign affairs, international relations, and, and politics. But around this time frame, you uh, also took the plunge and went and joined the Marines, right? Yeah, call me crazy. So <laughs> my, my dad was a Marine. He was a Korean War era Marine. He actually never got to Korea because his tank blew up in an exercise. He was the only survivor. Oh, wow. Never talked about it. Um, saw the letters and such like that. But he was always very proud of the Marine Corps. It was a big thing for him, so it became a big thing for me. So my dad died when I was 15, uh, but I'd always thought about the Marine Corps. When I talked to him about it, he was like, you know, stay in school, you know, at least get your high school degree, and go to college, be an officer, don't, don't do what I did. So, of course, I didn't listen to my father. Um, I, I did go to college, but then I got bored. My same kind of underachieving ways sort of struck me again, and uh, I went to a recruiter. The one thing I did listen to my family about, my, my mom and my sister, was they, they pleaded with me, don't go full-time active. There's a reserve program. Do that. It's six months. If you like it, stay. You know, but gives you options. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And the Marine Corps and I each found that we were not 
ideally suited for one another. <laughs> so um, I, I survived Paris Island because I realized very quickly the only way I was leaving Paris Island was to graduate because there was really no other way off the island. And uh, I did. So I, I did my time at Paris Island. They sent me to a radio school where I learned how to operate a PRC-77 for historians who are out there. <laughs> Uh, which is a, a, a radio they carry with the grunts, with the infantry and such. And I did that for a while at Camp Lejeune, did my, my six months, went back to college, which I realized wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it had been before I went to Paris Island. Um, the Marine Corps experience, though, was great. I, I, I remain very, very proud of being Marine. Um, I have two sons among my, my kids. One went Navy, uh, I don't know, uh, but I'm very proud of him. He's a Naval officer, he's a Lieutenant Commander, he's a surface warfare guy. My other son did go in the Marine Corps, and he was a major and you know, gave me many sleepless nights during two tours in Afghanistan. So uh, what the Marine Corps taught me was invaluable and absolutely contributed to my success in the agency over the years. What was that path like then? I mean, uh, presumably you did graduate college at a certain point. Uh, yes. You had some experience with the Marines. What was that path that – when did the CIA first come up on your radar as this even being a viable option for you? So a different time, right? This is uh, in the early 80s. Uh, there was no internet because today uh, the CIA advertises. They have cool commercials and they have a website and you go online and you, you apply to them. Back then it was the old-fashioned way other than you know cave drawings. Um, they came looking for you. And I was really, really lucky. Once again, I, again, things have been very fortunate for me. I've been very lucky in my life. And I had a professor who was a retired um, foreign service officer uh, doing what I'm doing now at Georgetown. He taught as an adjunct professor. He was retired, but he wanted to give back. He wanted to share. And he had been a two-time ambassador. And he was the most erudite, articulate, impressive human being I had ever met. I mean, I would pay just to listen to him speak. And I took some of his courses and I was really turned on to foreign policy and diplomacy. And I thought, I want to be a foreign service officer. So as wonderful as this man was, and he passed a long, long time ago, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have, if you would, the, the usual background of your typical foreign service officer at the time, um, more of a street kid, um, uh, but maybe a little rough around the edges. And I think he thought, uh, again, to use the, the HR quote that, I would be a better fit elsewhere. Um, what, I, what I didn't know was when he was teaching me was he had maintained a relationship with the CIA because one of his last assignments was at the United Nations. And he would help the agency to spot third country diplomats, people mm -hmm. that we were interested in while they were here in America that we could pursue. And he would be, if you would, like an access agent. I mean, he's a foreign service officer. He's an American citizen. So it's not like he was a spy or an agent not being paid, but he would share his insights. But he would also recommend people he thought might be good candidates for the organization. And he recommended me. So um, one day I, I remember being at home and, and I was just really lucky to get the call because I was putting myself through school. So I was like driving a taxi. I was a security guard. I was working in Alexander's, if you remember Alexander's, the department store from way, way back then. Uh, and I got a call from this chap who identified himself only as a federal government official. I had no idea what that meant. But he was offering me a possibility for a job. And I thought, well, that's OK. I could use a job because I've got jobs, but I wanted a career. I was graduating in college from college like six months out from the time I got this call, something like that. And I would have like, sure. So I went to this information session at which they told me and everybody else who was there, all of whom were in suits or the ladies in dresses. And I was in like torn up jeans and a, and a baggy sweatshirt, uh, a little bit like what I'm wearing tonight. But this is a, a nicer sweatshirt fire department in New York, by the way. And if you buy these, it goes to the families of the fire department for the fund. So I highly recommend you get those. Um, and uh, luckily, I said the right things. And they at least let me take the test, which I did OK enough on, and uh, got me interviews with the agency. But um, what they do, and, and they do similarly now, they'll, they'll, they'll interview some folks where they are, because they've got recruiters that go out. And they do job fairs and stuff like that. But they would bring people to Washington, and they brought me. But when I came to Washington for my, my official interviews, my formal interviews, I found when I was like in waiting rooms with the other candidates, that they were all there for like five days. They had like hotels for five days, and five day trips. And I was there for two days. And I thought, hmm, that's a clue. 
Um, but I once again had uh, luck shine on me. Uh, I talked about it in my book. The, uh, the first case officer interview I had was with a, a gentleman who uh, was an alias at the time. And uh, he took a shine to me and thought that I was different than a lot of the usual candidates. But he himself was a sort of a rough around the edges, Africa division guy, you know, really kind of earthy, really talented case officer. And he saw it was something he liked and also gave me a push. And, you know, the rest just, just worked out, thankfully. So you get accepted to the organization and what, what was it like uh, the, as far as the training at that point in early 1980s that you went through? So the, the training program that I had was uh, a little bit longer because I came in essentially right out of college. And even today, the CIA for the clandestine service will hire sort of in two lumps. Uh, they'll hire what they call the clandestine service trainee today, who are folks who not only have, you know, whatever credentials, education, work experience, languages, international travel, but they've also been around. They're not kids. They're you know, a little bit older, <laughs> mid, late 20s, early 30s, even maybe even a little older than that. Um, and that's what the bulk of the clandestine service is as far as candidates. But they take a chance on some younger folks who they think have a ceiling. So these days we call them professional trainees and they're folks that will come right out of college that score really well, interview really well, have some gifts, some talents, maybe language and such like that, but don't have a lot of what we call life experience, not a lot of seasoning. But they're worth bringing in, giving a little bit longer time, rotating on different desks at headquarters where we get to take a look at them, they get to learn a little bit, we get to see, are they a good fit? Will they be a case officer? Will they be something else? In my day, they called it the extended interim um, career training is what I was, so which is a two-year program. Uh, so they brought me in. Um, I did that for a while. Uh, and then during two, two times during those two years, one will be at the end, you went through two long trainings at what we call the farm. And everybody's heard of the farm and everybody knows where it is, though I'm still not allowed to say where it is, though I actually served there for a period as an instructor. But I can't say where it is. There's a lot of things many people can say that I can't say, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm not good at it. <laughs> so... Um, you go to the farm back then, we had um, the field tradecraft course, which is now the operational tradecraft course, which is where you had learned how to spot. And we had a paramilitary class. So the agency has always had a paramilitary history. Uh, it came from the um, Office of Special Services, Strategic Services, World War II, William Donovan, you know, helping you know, dissidents and insurgents and rebels behind enemy lines, the French resistance in World War II of uh, Jedbergs, the Jedberg program, uh, which we called it, which you still hear that term today, uh, and Suez Ponte. I know those of you who are Rangers uh, are familiar with it. So uh, it's, it's sort of a cross-section of various special ops uh, military activities. They give you, you know, maritime week where you're like doing boats and you're smuggling agents and water and you're meeting people at night in the water. So you got to learn, you know, navigation by sea. You have to learn how to operate Zodiacs and other boats and such as that, which was very cool. You have um, air, your air period, which where you're learning how to pack chutes and go up in small airplanes that fly real low and you push chutes out or you land on short airways and meet somebody. Um, and then you have all the, the ground training where you do, you know, small unit tactics, combat tactics, special operations, you know, sabotages, ambushes, setting up claymores, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you do this over 12 weeks and it also includes um, a, a very mini seer school where uh, you get like, you have to like flee and ambush and live in, in the woods and, and learn how to, you know, catch squirrels and skin them and, and, and what have you and poor little bunny rabbits. Uh, but you also then get caught uh, from your ambush later on where you get uh, detained and interrogated. And we were interrogated by real special ops um, interrogators from you know, green and blue and, and all those different folks. So it was a really interesting experience. Uh, and I thought really great training. And then the crescendo is if you pass the test, uh, two weeks of airborne school. So we condensed the three week airborne training into two. So we have one week of ground and one week of, of, uh, of jumping out of airplanes. And we got to get to our five jumps for to get our wings. And we really do if we do get our wings, I got my wings and got my blood wings and uh, my certificate, which I still have in my, in my home. It has hole punches in it because it was in my file for 34 years, so I can never see it. 
but uh, it's there in, in a frame. And it's, it's really cool because I, I, I think it served um, not just the, the, the history of where we came from, but for me, I, I was a Marine, but I was, you know, a, a weekend Marine, right? right? I mean, I went through boot camp and survived all that, but I wasn't living the life every day. And I was an enlisted chap to, to boot. I was going to be targeting military officers. I was going to be targeting elite military officers. So having gone through this training gave me some experience to speak to. And I tell you, once you get like wings on you, it's an entree into a club anywhere in the world <laughs> among other and I never considered myself an airborne trooper. I mean, I had five jumps, right? That was it. Got my wings and moved on from there. But as long as you don't like overstate what you are and just, and I told it like it was, I said, Hey, I went through the training to prepare me, but you know, I don't do what you do. I don't like have 300 jumps and halo and all that kind of stuff. They liked that. And it allowed me to meet, pursue and target military officers. Right. So it was, it was a great, great training. I thought we do a lot less of that these days. We have, Small elements of that, of course, we have for fo folks who are going into dangerous places or combat zone, sort of modular specialized training with weapons and, and counter-terrorist tactics and stuff like that. But this was a great program that we once had. Now, was that, the, I, please. Was that, was that uh, sort of 12-week portion, was that for everybody who is in that extended professional or that extended interim, uh, that, that training that you were in? Or was it only for people with military backgrounds? It was for everybody. It was for all clandestine service officers. So, uh, so the the folks who had prior military service, they actually loved it. I mean, right. for them, it was like camping, jumping out of airplanes. One of my buddies and I wrote about it in my book talked about these were Hollywood jumps, whatever that means. I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, they they had a lot of fun. For us civilians, it wasn't necessarily as fun, but it was rewarding. But during my program, they actually included other career trainees. So career trainees at the time wasn't just the clandestine service. The agency was bringing in, you know, a cadre of officers that they wanted to groom in other directorates as well, the analytics side, the support side, the tech side. So we had a bunch of them too. And, and pretty much all of them were like really civilians. I mean, these were folks who, you know, for them, they used to joke that this was like outward bound training, but they didn't have to pay for it. So, uh, so it was really quite a mix. Yeah, that's interesting. How, you know, and you had been through Paris Island and you had other people who were in the military. How did the people who were like straight out of college had never done anything or even maybe people who had been in the workforce for a while, but maybe had never even been on a camping trip. Like, how did they, how did they deal with that training? And was there actually like a washout rate from that? So for them, they weren't going to wash out because of this. It was like sort of a gift for them. It was also a great opportunity to bond with other people outside of your career service who you might work with later uh -huh. and have this really great shared experience. It kind of fell as it does with people. Some people really embraced it and loved it. Some people weren't so happy and right. expressed their unhappiness. Yeah. So you, you got to mix. I think people who sort of made the best of it, even if it was not their cup of tea, did the best from it and, yeah. and are remembered best by the rest of us, as opposed to those who were maybe a little more, I don't want to say whining, but <laughs> eh, you know, didn't come off with the same uh, pristine reputation. Sure. Doug, before we move on to the next thing, one thing I, I wanted to take a second, because you mentioned the CIA's history and sort of their background with the OSS and the Jedbergs and so on. Um, something you mentioned in your book that I thought was interesting was that, Unlike the military, a lot of people in the CIA do not really know or appreciate the organization's history. Um, you know, when you see a Marine, you, I mean, you know this perfectly well, of course, but others out there, I mean, Marines take an, a, a massive amount of pride in what that organization is built upon. Mm -hmm. uh, all the things on their uniform, the mm -hmm. blood stripe on their trousers, yeah, get, the leather neck. It, it all classes in boot camp, his Marine Corps history classes. It, 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 it yeah. all means something, yeah. um, a lot to them, and they take immense pride in it. And as I was reading your book, you, you said that doesn't really exist at the agency. And it, and it reminded me of a gentleman I met once who he served 20 years in Army Special Forces, and then he did 20 some odd years in the CIA. And he told me, he kind of complained to me, there's no camaraderie in the CIA like there is in Special Forces. And, and that was something you touched upon a bit in your book. I was wondering if, if you could give your perspective on maybe why that's a problem. 
Yeah, it's a fair point. Um, having been a Marine, I expected the same of the CIA. I expected that sense of, you know, we were an elite service and um, the, the case officers were an elite part of the elite service. Uh, but there was none of that. Um, there's real no, I won't say no, it's unfair. There's little sense of, of history. There's little sense of your roots. Uh, we do have the museum now, which is actually a fabulous place. It's the best museum you'll never see. I think is uh, is how it's referred to by the curators. <laughs> but uh, if you get to be a visitor, it's a great place to go. Uh, but there was actually a deliberate effort to um, mitigate against a sense of elitism as a CIA officer, and then as a clandestine service officer. Um, and it got worse, actually, and not better over the years. So there was a sense of elitism for the area divisions you might have been part of. So I joined in 84. I, I, when I graduated, I, I became an officer in the Near East and South Asia Division. Great deal of pride among any division case officers. And particularly at that time, we were really at war. You know, Hezbollah, the embassy bombing, the Marine barracks bombing, our chief of station killed, mm -hmm. our second chief of station kidnapped and killed. So there was a real sense of elitism there, but not as a career service. As I say, it got worse because uh, one of the things I criticized Director John Brennan for was Director John Brennan wanted to really remove any sense the DO had, the clandestine service had, of being elite, of being special. He wanted everybody to be, well, you're all intelligence officers. You're not even CIA officers. You're intelligence officers. And Bureaucrats. nobody's more special than anybody else, right? So so I think that uh, that really does a disservice because when you're in an organization that takes risk puts people's lives at risk, and, and that's the agents as well as our own people that are out there. I think you need a amount of swagger and yeah. cockiness and confidence um, to have. Unfortunately, a lot of case officers just have the cockiness, um, but they don't have the, the real sense of pride in the organization right. or in their colleagues that, okay, you're a fellow case officer, you're, you know, my compadre and stuff like that. You're right. There's there's not the same kind of camaraderie, not anywhere near as much. And in fact, it gets pretty competitive at times. Right. And pretty nasty yeah. at times. And that, that makes a lot of sense too, because when you think about the military, especially in, you know, frontline units, infantry units, whatnot, you know Cheers, by the way. Jessica. Oh, cheers. And cheers to you guys. And thanks for joining us tonight. You know, you have camaraderie and and the motivation, uh, you know, and all the things that go along with that sort of esprit de corps, um, whether it's acting right in, in a proper manner, whether it's, you know, uh, personal courage in a certain situation, because there is a unit of people that you are accountable to. And then, you know, just the people on your left and your right. Then if, you know, if you're serving a unit or, or the Marine Corps, for instance, or whatever, like there's pride in that. In the agency, I, I imagine that most case officers are operating on their own. So they're not going to have that immediate band of camaraderie, right? They're not going to have that to latch on to. And if they don't have fallback on, you know, the either, the, you know, their branch uh, or their division office or the CIA in general, then what what are they i don't want to say what are they loyal to in, in the army it's even like you know it's like my unit scaled the cliffs at point to hawk right. on d-day like right. I, I can't let those boys down right you know right i can't but, i have to live up to that legacy right but but it also leads to potentially like maybe why sometimes and i know this wasn't organizational why with the industry but sometimes when the agency did, or people did go off the rails, it was because they weren't really serving anything larger. They were just out there doing, doing their thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be fair, to be balanced, um, agency officers I've seen uh, numerous examples of over the years, when they thought their colleagues were at risk or they thought their agents were at risk, they would put themselves in harm's way oh, sure. without blinking an eye. Sure, sure. That was less about, you know, Remember how Beirut Station did this and that, you know, it wasn't that, it was because they were committed to each other and, and particularly so to our agents. I mean, our case officers usually get killed in the process of trying to protect an agent. Right. Right. Or, or one another. But your right. point is very true. Being a case officer is a very autonomous profession. It's usually a case officer out on the street. There's 
there's no team, if you would, except in the paramilitary ops. Uh, but you're you're right in that it's it's not always about oh I'm doing this great thing for the agency. It's about how's this going to make me look. You know, will this make me stand above my my peers and my competitors? Being a case officer is a really weird thing. Uh, it's it's full of contradictions. Mm-hmm. So it's a really hard personality to to explain. But you, you're taking an individual who has to be really confident, have a lot of swagger, which comes with an ego, doesn't mm-hmm. it? But you're asking that person to suppress their ego because their agent's always the most important. Mm-hmm. Their agent's the center of the universe. It has to all be about their agent, not about them. When they're cultivating agents, it's not, oh, I'm really cool. I'm a badass. It's like, tell me your story and how can I help you? It's all about that. They get no public recognition. Right. There's no like public medals. And the agency, it's like you almost have to die to get a medal in the agency. The agency doesn't like giving out medals. They really just don't. And when they do, it's usually to senior people who've been behind a desk right. as opposed to the people who are out there, you know, running spies, but by guns. So <laughs> when it comes to their validation, it's about their competitive natures to be advanced to better jobs, promotions, to be in a clique, uh, to get a, a, a plump assignment. That's how they feed their ego. And that's where a lot of that competitiveness comes from. And if you don't have that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for the pride of my unit or the pride of my station or the pride of, you know, my organization, you're going to get people who go off the rails because those same egos, which have to be kept in check, sometimes right. could really get out of hand. Right. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And, and I mean, to be fair, it's a very, very tough job. And I don't, I don't know that, you know, that people, you know, people like us who have never been case officers can understand just how tough it is to live in that world of gray, you know? Um, but, you know, it's easy to criticize things when they go wrong. Um, but like you said, they don't get public recognition. They don't get awards, or if they do, their awards are buried until they retire or, or whatever else. And I, I'm, I, I'm sure it's, it's extremely challenging in those ways. It's a grind. Yeah, no doubt. And I talk about that in my book, but think about the privilege of responsibility. And I say privilege of responsibility. Um, I teach a class, uh, you know, a graduate's course here in Washington, D.C. Uh, at Georgetown. So shout out to Georgetown, who was kind of tired me. And they're graduate students and they, they take uh, their studying for masters in national security, intelligence, what have you like that. And I teach a course on human intelligence operations. And I think I sometimes get carried away because we do some case studies. And I'll talk about, you know, famous spies of the past, Tolkachev, the billion dollar spy, or Polyakov, or, or some of these amazing iconic spies who changed history. Uh-huh. I mean, they just changed history. And they changed history with one case officer on the street. <laughs> one case officer out there with this amazing agent being the conduit by keeping that agent safe, by reporting it faithfully, not making it up, not embellishing, not fabricating saves lives, changes history. That's a privilege. It's a huge responsibility and it, it's, uh, it accounts for lots of bad things, you know, failed marriages, you know, alcohol dependency, you know, whatever, if you would, in some cases. Uh, but at the same point, what you're being asked to do, what you're earning, hopefully will earn is there, I, I can't think of any other, any other job like it. And I, I tell my students that I think they think I get a little carried away, but I mean, I can't imagine anything more gratifying, at least anything more that I could do. I mean, I wasn't going to be an astronaut or a scientist or a doctor. I barely got through school, but that I could be a part of that is just amazing. Yeah. Doug, I tell us a little bit about, you know, you initially get to the agency. uh, You wanted to join the Near East Division, which you spoke about a little bit. They were kind of seen as uh, the cowboys or the the badasses of the time because of what was going on in the Middle East. Um, you tell I thought it was interesting in your book. I mean, you don't pull too many punches in in your book, The Recruiter. Here, I uh, you talk about how there is some trepidation about you even joining the Near East Division, being one of those uh, lower East Side New Yorkers, uh, as some put it. 
Yeah, I, I never heard that phrase until I got to the agency. <laughs> I mean, if somebody called you Lower East Side, it's because that's where you're from. You know, you're a South Bronx guy. You're, yeah, that's where I live. Uh, so I, I, I did a long interim, one of these uh, long assignments I told you that a, a trainee does, especially a trainee like me who wasn't seasoned. And I had a, just an incredible time. I mean, just an exciting time to be there. And I know it's probably a little twisted because bad things were happening that made it exciting. But I saw the operations, I saw the intel, I, 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 it, was, it was like watching, you know, spy movies up close and real, and it's really happening. And so that's where I wanted to be. And everybody was really nice to me. I mean, I was well taken care of any division. Uh, as a trainee, they actually gave me a, a, a trip, a TDY, which was unheard of for a trainee, right? But because they thought I'd earned it, and I got to do this cool thing that I can't really talk about, because it was under um, not official cover, under commercial cover, but it was the first time I ever left the country. I got to travel in the Middle East and do neat and fun things, and they paid for it. It was awesome. So at the end of my, my time, and I'm getting ready to leave, as, as I talk about my book, I go to um, one of my bosses, and I describe him as, um, I actually forget their name, I <laughs> the book, but I use an alias for them because they're both very fine gentlemen. And I, I go to the deputy and I say, you know, when he asked me, where are you going next? And then what do you want to do later? I go, I want to come back here. This is so cool. And he's like, but you're Jewish. And I, I honestly didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, yeah, and <laughs> it's going to be so cool. And I'm going to do it. I said, but you're Jewish. Almost like he was surprised I'd even think of coming because any was really a, a, a real reflection of that old OSS, um, early CIA model of, East Coast establishment, Catholics or Harvard, Yale. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. And it really was because a lot of the folks who learned Arabic learned it by, you know, they were, you know, the, the, the sons of missionaries right. or learned it at Harvard or, or what have you and, and, and all. So he was a really nice guy and, and sort of gave me my first sort of wake up call that you may not be really well accepted here. They may not think you're a good, again, the good fit I keep using. Uh, and he was diplomatic about it um, and uh, then referred me to his boss, our, our bigger boss, absolutely wonderful gentleman, one of the best case officers I have ever known. Um, but he very much matter-of-factly just said, well, you know, I don't know that you'd be very competitive here because you're Jewish and, and we don't have Jewish case officers because they're seen – as you know, and he again really wouldn't be specific about we don't trust you uh, here at any, but uh, but that some of my colleagues wouldn't like me because they themselves weren't really enamored with Jewish people. Right. Uh, and then I, you know, was then moved to the next person who was uh, we called him the, the PEMS officer, the person on evaluation management officer, sort of like an HR person, but a case officer who's HR for the other case officer. And uh, very, again, classic Arabic speaker, great experience, and, you know, very successful case officer, had been nothing but nice to me, but uh, said, well, you know, do you wear it on your sleeve? <laughs> and I, and, and, and I like, did I, you know, at lunch, did I <laughs> like, get the pizza on my sleeve or something? And he goes, well, you know, being, being Jewish. And, and again, I was like, wow, I didn't know what that meant, but he genuinely asked me if I had to take direction from my rabbi. He wanted to know if you were in the audience or the cast. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was a really weird dynamic. And, and uh, I was saved by, I could refer to him as only as Tom T. Um, he was a senior officer. He'd go to be the head of the service later on, like the nicest man. In the, he was the case officer we all wanted to be. We called him Mr. Rogers, but for an affectionate reason, because we all wanted to be him. He was just so nice and just you wanted to work for him. If you were going to be a spy, you wanted to spy for him. And he like expressed outrage and basically brought me into any division. But that didn't save me from some of my other colleagues. And I would run into my first chief of station who called me his Jew, who wanted to kick me out from the, before he even got there. And, and then the other boss I had who referred to me as one of those you know, Lower East Side New Yorkers who get under his skin. So yeah, it was uh, it was a, a awakening, and you know I don't know that I handled it in the perfect way. I certainly would handle it differently today, but I just wanted to be there and part right. of the team. 
Right. Yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to laugh a little bit, Doug. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, it, the it, it's serious any sort of discrimination, but I, I mean, it just seems so ridiculous looking at it. You know, like how and but. Well, and it's also. I mean, it's just because even when you're describing growing up, right? When you're saying like the the racism and 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 like the intercultural uh, rivalries. I mean, you're talking about Italians and Catholics and you know Irish. And, you know, black, and, and I mean, to think of how outraged a lot of people were that JFK was a Catholic right. when he was elected, you know, it, it's things that we, we don't even think about anymore, or anymore, we hope we don't. but how at the, or maybe, I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't know, but, but the, but how, uh, antiquated it seems to us, but it's not that far back in our past that, these were like major issues, you know, and maybe they yeah. still are in some ways. I don't know. I it's, think what, 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 what I found, I guess maybe it's not the right thing to come away with, but I was joining a, a an international spy service. I was uh -huh. joining a service that prided itself on its ability to operate in any culture, in any environment and recruit people from completely different walks of life. Right. How can folks like that be racist? Right. Or but, bigoted. But or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. It, it makes total sense. Yeah. And well, once you did get your feet on the ground, Doug, it, it sounded from your book that you were a, a bit of a cocky young case officer, quite aggressive in uh, trying to recruit assets, even when uh, some of the saltier officers uh, around the water cooler tried to back you off. Yeah, because uh, I, I loved it. I mean, it was like a kid in a candy store. So basically, they were turning me loose to do legally what I probably did a little bit illegally as a kid in New York. You know, <laughs> awesome, right? Uh, and, and so my validation, my tangible reward was racking up recruitments. And, and not just recruitments for numbers sakes, but recruitments who were producing intelligence and significant intelligence. Intelligence that would change, at least inform decisions, maybe change history. Uh, so I was having a, a, a great time and, and, and very aggressive. And, and I had a, you know, I had a, it's, being a spy, being a case officer is a really is an experiential based profession. And I say as much in the book because you can't give people case officer skills. You can teach people tradecraft and it comes easier to some than others. But how to sort of size up someone, get into their head, um, disarm them emotionally in a way where you're able to establish a real intimate, and I don't mean physically, though it happens, I guess, an intimate relationship where they will, you know, see what you want them to do as their own idea. That's just like incredible. Uh, but you can't teach that to people. And, and uh, the agency, at least internally, and they, they've let me say publicly, that uh, of all the recruitments that we do in the, in the clandestine service, and the numbers have been pretty steady, 80% uh, of those recruitments are generally done by 20% of the case officer population because you just can't teach everybody how to do it. Some people can't pull the trigger. Some people can't relate to folks of certain backgrounds or you know they just can't get along and forge a relationship. But I was really lucky. Um, I was able to sort of you know fine tune whatever persona I was gonna be. I was gonna be you know, airborne Doug for the military officer or academic Doug for the for the diplomat or whatever I had to be. And it was like role playing. And it was just really cool. So um, not everybody really liked that. And and I, I got a reputation early about being a bit arrogant. And I wish I could say it was undeserved. <laughs> but, you know, I was young and, and immature. And then I became old and immature. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, probably... Something I, 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 if I had to do it all over again, I would change nothing what I did operationally, but I'd probably try to, you know, pull back maybe my attitude. So, Doug, I want to ask you, you know, so growing up in New York, you know, doing the Marines, going into the agency, and then, you know, you, you did your training. What was it like for you on your very first um, on your very first, you know, uh, a, a recruitment attempt or assessment, like what, what were you feeling? Did you feel up to it? Did you, you're like, I got this, no problem. Were you nervous? What was that like for you? It's, um, it was nerves, but good nerves. It's like the nerves you have before you're about to do something 
And then once you start doing it, the nerves all go away and you're just there. So my first, if I remember correctly, my first actual operational act was a turnover. So I was inheriting an agent from the case officer I was succeeding. So I was replacing somebody who was handing over his, his assets to me. And uh, it was a military officer, as I recall, and I'll keep it all general and stuff like that. Uh, but I just, I was so excited. I just, I just, I couldn't wait. And, and a turnover, there's a process. Uh, and, and, and the process, and I talked maybe a little bit about it in the book. In fact, I, I know I do. You know, it's a, it's a matter of transferring the relationship, transferring the trust and mm -hmm. the rapport from old case officer to new. But it's also when you're going over obligations so that, you know, the old case officer doesn't walk out of the room and the agent goes, well, you owe me $2,000. And you go, uh, not according to the file, well, you right. do, you know, or this is all I'll do for you. I'll only do this much or whatever. So it's an opportunity for you to review what's the agent been doing? Why does the agent do it? So the case officer old is actually reviewing to the new case officer and it's all theater so that the agent hears it. Mm -hmm. This is what we expect of you, mm -hmm. right? Hey, you know, Ahmed has been doing this because, you know, his daughter got sick and they wouldn't hospitalize her at the army military hospital. And he felt it was wrong and da, 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 and whatever. And uh, so I'm waiting for, for my piece. And then uh, at that point, actually, we like it best when the old case officer leaves the room and allows the new case officer to establish themselves. Mm -hmm. The old case officer was a very good case officer and also a pretty aggressive chap. I didn't want to leave the room. So I guess at some point I just really inserted myself and I took charge of the meeting because I'd be like holding it in and holding it in and waiting, but I already had my game plan. And, and in espionage, you always have a game plan, but it's subject to change, right? Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? Same as spot or, and in war and in combat. But I wanted to go right for it. And to my colleague's credit, he backed down when I started doing my thing and did, did the meeting, you know, the, the agent liked me and, Got intel, did the admin piece, all went well. Agent gets dropped off, he's gone. And the case officer goes, wow, I didn't really expect that, you know, because I thought you'd kind of be more laid back. And, and I just, I couldn't wait. So, yeah, nerves up until the point I got to start, you know, opening my mouth. But I'll tell you the truth, and I tell students this, and I'm talking spy students or younger officers when I talk to farm. I got that nervous excitement, the, the, the butterflies, Every time I went out, and I mean, like, even on the last operational things I did as, a, as an old coot, I still felt that way. And, and I think it was because it was that important to me, and I always felt that charge from it. And I, for one, uh, enjoyed the war stories, as you put it, in your book, uh, talking about recruiting assets. And I'd like to ask you about a few of them. I, You're not... Uh, I, I, it's probably impossible for me to go in chronological order. I don't know if it's your writing style or rather the CIA just doesn't want any of us to know precisely when these events happened. Uh, the, the countries are also not named and, and it all ha you had to make it generic um, so that these people could not be identified. Uh, could you talk to us about the terrorist that you name, uh, quote unquote, Yousef in the book he, that you flipped uh, and, and kind of brought over to the other side? Yeah, Yusuf, I, I, I was going to say, oh, I love Yusuf, and he was a terrorist, so that's probably not the right thing to say. Um, Yusuf was a really interesting guy. He was a really unique person, and uh, he, fortunately for me, had terrible luck. Uh, and I basically took advantage of his bad luck for, for my good luck. So I say in the book very clearly, and I stand behind it, the CIA does not use coercion in recruiting people. And the reason we don't isn't because we just have a great moral compass and clearly we've made some significant mistakes or lapses in morality and ethics. And we can talk about, you know, enhanced interrogation or whatever like that. But it's a it's a matter of efficiency. Coercion doesn't work effectively. Uh, some services use them steadily. The Russians do, China, Iran, North Korea, um, and a number of other services that I just won't get into. It's easier for me to get away with just naming those those biggies. One, because it's easier. You get dirt on somebody, you compromise them, you're done. The Russians call it mice, which is um, money, ideology, compromise, you know, compromising material, and ego. So they love to get dirt on somebody because it takes away the work of spotting, assessing, developing, cultivating, recruiting, all that kind of stuff. You just you put pictures of them sleeping with somebody or 
your drinking problem or they're in debt and, and they're yours, but they're not really. Right. They'll do the minimum they can and they could turn on you at any time where they have the advantage. CIA has to stand behind its intelligence. We have to go to our consumers and go, we believe in this agent to different degrees. We have what's called source descriptions, which assess the agent's veracity, uh, their access to the intelligence of which they're speaking and their reliability. And it's a process that goes over time how much we've tested them, how long they've reported, so we can say how much confidence we have in, in, in whatever report they produce. You can't do that with somebody who's black man. Having said all that, which I stand behind is true, we might play a little rough around the edges just to get our foot in the door. And, and that's in the case of flipping a jailhouse recruit, which is how I wanted Yusuf to be. He wasn't at the time. So Yusuf showed up in my country that I was serving, and for Yusuf, it was kind of like the end of the world. Uh, he was on the run, uh, but with his family, which was telling in and of itself. So he had been in places where we knew somebody with his kunya, his nickname. So Arabs often use what they call a kunya, which is a nickname for their first child. Um, Abu, Abu David, Abu Sarah, depending if it's a boy or a girl, will be how they're known to their friends. His nickname was unique because the child's name was particularly unique. And his family size was unique and where he came from. And where he came from, he had sort of uh, paralleled the course of a terrorist facilitator who had been in places where there had been terrorist attacks or where Al-Qaeda cells had been wrapped up before they could be. And during their interrogations, would mention this facilitator by his kunya. So um, I was working with the local foreign partner, the local government service. At the time, I had a specialized team from them that was dedicated to my station that we could use for local operations. And they just routinely gave me the names of particularly folks that were, you know, this was, this was before 9-11, mind you, but this was after the uh, East Africa bombings in 98. It was after the attack on the USS Cole in 2000. So we had a very heightened antenna and we knew Al Qaeda was up to something. So we get this name, we do routine traces and our headquarters Officers, our targeters, our analysts say, you know, this could be this guy based on them sort of putting the picture together. So we decided to mount the operation to find out if it was that guy. And I won't, you know, belabor this really too long. We we determined over time by running a whole bunch of different things that I won't detail that uh, he most likely was this guy, but he was here. Why? And at the same time, remember, this is before 9-11. This is in that 2000, 2001 period where the alarm bells were ringing as the 9-11 Commission report and CIA was producing finished products, not just the August PDB about bin Laden determined to strike the homeland, but a lot of other reporting saying they're, they've got something. It's inevitable. It could be here. It could be elsewhere. It's coming. We don't know what it is. So there was a panic at headquarters that if this guy was here, based on all the activities he'd been involved, he was going to be part of a terrorist operation. And they just wanted to disrupt it. And they'd gone to a strategy, which they would keep for years, actually, of not wanting to run an operation against a target like this, but just to maybe put him out of business, even if it was temporary, have him detained, have him questioned, have him expelled. Maybe that will at least throw Al-Qaeda off of its timing and stop or slow something down. So they ordered me to have him detained. Mm -hmm. And just trivia or whatever, uh, authorities and law, U.S. law, the CIA can't ask another government to do anything. It can't do itself. So CIA had come up with authority to detain him based on uh, a 1986 finding, uh, which still stands today, along with some other ones. Uh, but I said, I want to recruit this guy. I think he's recruitable. Over the time I'd been watching this person and I was watching him mm -hmm. uh, in literal ways and not just figurative, you kind of get to know somebody. You like surveillance teams get to know people and and I had a lot more than just surveillance. And I thought, there's something just different about this guy. If he's going to conduct a terrorist operation, why is he here with his family? Why is he here in this place? Why is he doing some of this stuff? And why is he such a horrible business person? Because God love him or not, he's a horrible business person. He was in one money-making scheme after another that kind of went south. So I wanted permission to try to recruit him. They said, no, you got to detain him. Back and forth. They said, okay, you know what? You got... 48 hours to get this all done, um, get him detained, pitch him while he's under detainment, and then if he goes along with it, fab. If not, then try to get the local government to expel. 
So that's a tall order to do. Uh, so my team and I put together this, it was a little bit of a Mission Impossible kind of stuff. We took over a building, we made it look like a jail. We actually got a jail in there and we had people look like cops who were arresting him and then all this kind of fun stuff. And we did that. Uh, and then in a choreographed way, I had my senior team guy, who was a local of that government, Pose being a member, which really was a local service, which didn't have the best reputation. They had a reputation of being thugs. Uh -huh. uh, my team wasn't because they had to report to us and they had to be working under a different set of standards. And he kind of gave the setup for me. And I went into uh, the room because there was a jail cell, but a little conference room we brought him into. And it was a, a hot place. It was stifling hot. Um, I was in my nice suit. I was playing the part. It was like in the middle of the night, three in the morning, whatever it was. And I was in whatever alias, and I had my little file. Uh, and, and what you do, and, and you all who are special forces types and stuff, you know, the worst thing an interrogator could ever do is bluff and be wrong. Mm -hmm. But when you've got stuff that you could stand behind, that will at least kind of get you some credentials, that's what you use. So I really knew his real name. I really knew where he was. I knew the names of his family members. And I was able to use that and basically say, you know, right now you got a choice. I mean, you know... If I let the local government have its way, they're just going to send you to this country, which will imprison, torture, and execute, mm -hmm. which actually, you know, they would have done. Because mm -hmm. they had done that with the other people he had left behind at his last country, and he knew that. I said, you don't do me any good dead. I said, you know, the only value you have for me, if you're willing to, you know, work with me. And one of the challenges is Al-Qaeda trains people to say yes to that. They train people to feign cooperation to minimize their role in the organization, but acknowledge it, to say, I got mixed up with the wrong people. I'll tell you whatever. One, to like protect the real secrets, maybe get a chance to escape or maybe set you up for, for ambush. So he did that, which meant, okay, that's a good start that he's saying, I'll work with you, mm -hmm. but how do I really then vet it? Right. So, you know, uh, I had set up with my crew a little off the beaten path now, resort is too nice a term. It was kind of like a bungalow, uh, but it was for tourists from that country. So it wasn't really high fluid, but it was a good, safe place to be. And over the course of a week, uh, over every day, I debriefed him. And he provided every day increasingly compromising material, which would have got him in a lot of trouble as well. And over time, we developed a relationship of tremendous trust. I mean, I sent him on the road. He did some amazing things. He disrupted any number of terrorist operations and helped put a lot of his terrorist friends, I'll put it lightly, out of business. Um, and at the end of that time, I remember when I had to turn him over, he, uh, it was a very emotional day. It was a lot of hugging, a lot of kissing. I kissed a lot of men in my day uh, because it's very traditional for our men to, you know, give kisses on the cheek and stuff like that. And as he's crying, he's saying, you know, when I first met you, I was so afraid of you, but now that I know the real you, you're really a softy because that's what we had to be to have that nature of trust where he was still putting his life on the line for me and actually working against his own group, in some case, his own family. And it's not like he ever became a Jeffersonian Democrat. He never liked the United States. Right. He was happy when 9-11 happened. He thought we got our comeuppance. Uh-huh. Um, and he was candid about all that. So he did work for the CIA and me because a love of America or even for the money. He worked because of the trust. I did take care of him. I did take care of his family, but not just me, the institution did. And he served for actually quite a number of years. And, you know, you mentioned earlier that, like, one of the things that the CIA does not do is coercion. And I think that is... <clears throat> One of the images that people who don't know anything about the CIA sometimes think that it's all about, oh, here are some photos with you and your mistress, you know, do this for us or this goes public. And it's like you say, you don't build trust. You don't build that relationship. You can't trust the information you're getting that it all comes down to that personal relationship and, and right. having that, right? It does. So, I mean, do you want to meet with, a terrorist that you like coerced in the back street of a city where, you know, you're surrounded by terrorists. Right. It's, it's, it's not really in your own best interest. So there's a lot of practical reasons beyond standing behind their intelligence that it's just not wise to do. Doug, I wanted to circle around on another anecdote you relate in the book, 
where you talk about uh, a, a, a gentleman you name Lex in the book who sends you on sort of a liaison mission to develop a, a counterterrorism relationship with a foreign country. And he's not believing what you're reporting back to him. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. So Lex comes into the picture a little bit later. Uh, I was actually sent on that mission by then director George Tennant. And this was um, after 9-11, uh, prior to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And uh, this episode has been documented in books, including George Tennant's books and uh, Ambassador Burns' book. But I'm still not at liberty to get into great detail um, because my role was clandestine and there were some cover considerations at the time. So um, Mr. Tennant uh, wanted to have uh, interaction with the head of this country's intelligence service, but for political reasons, we had no embassy there. We had very bad relations. We were actually in a state of hostility with this country. He wanted to pick somebody who's more like the rank of a full colonel as opposed to a flag officer. And it was sort of a political message. So this country was in my country, my department. I, I was the chief of a group, an ops group uh, for the Near East. And uh, this country was one of the countries over which I ran operations and I was responsible. So he sent me to do it. The relationship, um, you know, it went well. I actually got involved first as part of a diplomatic negotiation. I was the CIA guy on this diplomatic back channel that Ambassador Burns was then Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East was heading up because uh, the Intel Service was now sitting there, chief of the Intel Service, who really was the most influential person in the delegation, had the ear of, of whomever was at home. So I was able to break off with this guy uh, and we were able to make some progress in terms of the diplomatic peace. But then uh, his country was trying to get out of this air of hostility with us because uh, it saw 9-11, it saw our invasion of Afghanistan, it saw we were preparing to invade Iraq. It didn't want to be next. Right. So they started trading CT information and really good counterterrorist information. So we were meeting over a period of time in different countries around the world. Uh, I got so much that he had to bring his bag man, some assistant. I brought uh, a collection management officer with me, sometimes an analyst, because the take was really that good. And then out of nowhere, at some point, um, he just offers that um, you know, my country is willing to get rid of its, how should I put it, weapons of mass destruction. So by this point, Lex had assumed a very senior position above me uh, in my chain of command. And he was not really particularly a fan of mine. And I probably would have never gotten the, the gig that Mr. Tennant gave me if he was around. But I'd done really well. I'd been rewarded. I had citations for it, yada, 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 whatever. So I'd proven myself. But when I came back with this reporting, he said, BS, you're making it up. He basically said, you're trying to say you're recruiting this guy. There's no way I was going to recruit this guy. This guy was a thug. He was, you know, the, you know, really close to an awful dictator. Uh, he told me one time, he was like, you know, Douglas, you know, with these uh, Tedes people, it's very difficult because, you know, I hit them and hit them and hit them and they still don't tell me anything. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like this was a humanitarian guy. And I didn't pretend that, and if you were, but we had a level of trust, not friendship, but he's Arab and in the culture, we refer to each other as brother, right? Um, and, and so we had trust reinforced by experience. I had delivered, he had delivered, it was valuable to him, it was valuable to me. And that's how I put it. But Lex didn't quite believe that. So um, I had to basically uh, tell this guy, no, we weren't interested, or at least at first I delayed. And uh, eventually he sent his uh, assistant to see me, which was a sign. And then uh, I went back to Lex, Lex said, still no dice. And then he went to another service, uh, a, a service that's allied to the United States and made the same offer. The allied told us, then Lex pushed me out of the operation and showed up the next week. It's uh, yeah, kind of wild. Um, I, so he just wanted to quit. Um, he didn't like that you would be able to sort of claim credit for it or he wanted that for himself. I mean, what, what do you think was going on there? 
Well, initially, I think he generally didn't believe me. I think one of the issues that Lex had, Lex was of that early Near East crew that I mentioned, uh, he was very racist, and not just against Jews. I mean, anyone who wasn't an Opus Dei Catholic was questionable in his book. Oh my God. If you were white and Christian, okay, not so bad. But if you were alternative lifestyle, if LGBT or QT or whatever, if you were um, black or Hispanic or Asian, you were not to be trusted. And so I really think at that point, because I had been very successful, he was one of those who thought my success was embellished. I could not have had all these great successes. But remember, the proof's in the pudding. You've got to turn over your agent. Right. If your right. agent doesn't turn over, okay, maybe you made him up. If your right. agent turns over and is still working for five, 10 years, then. Right. And it's still producing. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you, I can't like create human beings. Um, I think at, when the Allied Service uh, basically said and repeated the exact same thing my Arab friend had said was legit, he was like, dang, you know, how do I cover up delaying and also get Doug out of the picture and claim the credit and come in as the, the savior. The irony what it, uh, of it all was that I had to then work closely to tutor Lex on this guy. I had to put together briefing books. I had to write up these in-depth assessments and personality assessments that he would then use when he met this guy. So it was, you know, does, does, when somebody, a, when somebody in a senior position like that, um, like moves in in that way does it do people above them go well that's odd like that's not a usual thing that happens do they question that so since lex was in a very senior position and had been a case officer and it was unusual for a case officer to be in that position which is probably more than i should say um people deferred to him above who were civilians who were like civilian leadership outside the organization. Okay. They just assume Lex knows what he's talking about. Yeah, it's a little unusual. Like, for example, the meetings I had with Lex never had a note taker. There is no meeting with somebody at his level that doesn't include a note taker. It's usually their executive assistant, their chief of staff, sometimes a lawyer, but there's always a document, an official record kind. It was always one-on-one -on -one between him, which was really weird. Even my own division chief, was excluded from these meetings, which is just really weird. So it'd be like, you know, um, I don't know, the uh, the corps commander talking to a brigade commander without the division commander there, maybe, something right. like that. Right. Find some embarrassing, which is really weird, right? Right. So, right. You know, I'm a full colonel in the office of a of a of a, a theater commander, even like Commander Sencom, and my own division commander, my you know, none of these people at the meeting. Right. So that was unusual. And they just chalked it up. Well, well, he's a case officer. So that's how he does this. Right. That's, that's fascinating. What are the other stories that you relate in the book? And I, I really wanted to ask you about, because I think this is one of the more interesting things uh, that the CIA does. We had a conversation with uh, HK Roy uh, in the past, who was also a case officer where he recruited a, uh, a, a uh, head of intelligence in an Eastern European country you had an experience like this with a, a guy you name Nick, who you convinced to become a double agent. And the story, you, you will, uh, are not bashful at all about using your family in the process of this and other instances as well, where your, your wife and your children play a role as well in, in your official work. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us about, about Nick and about how you recruited him. So to be fair, Nick certainly wasn't a, the head of an intelligence service. He was an intelligence officer from a country on our criteria list of bad countries. Um, we were both in the same country, and uh, I was able to meet him uh, in the diplomatic circuit, uh, which was good and, and also sometimes chancy because when you're meeting somebody from a, an autocratic country, a, sort of a police state, you want to sort of limit uh, anything that highlights you having contact with them in front of their colleagues, let's say, from an embassy or whatever, because you don't want them to get in trouble. You don't want them to be tainted from the start. But it, it, it worked out for Nick and me at the time. Um, so, you know, unless you're in a, in a war zone or a really high risk place, and, and, and I have served in such places where you don't have your family, most traditional tours, even places that are unstable, austere, or volatile, you'll have your family with you. I mean, it goes to the territory. There's, you know, you've got to be concerned about medical care, you know, coups, 
finding chicken to cook, you know, things like that. But, you know, if you're willing to do it, and it creates a sort of a, a sort of grid among foreign service families, which I extend not just to CIA, but my State Department colleagues, AID, you know, the military, all that kind of stuff, who sometimes like they like that. They get into that. It's part of part of their lifestyle. Uh, but you do leverage all that as a case officer. You know, the thing about a case officer is it's not a job that you turn on and turn off. When you're a case officer, particularly in the field, everything you do is deliberate. You're establishing a persona. When I say persona, I don't mean like an alias. You're creating what you want people to think of you, how you're perceived. You do it for deliberate reasons for counterintelligence purposes. So on a defensive side, you minimize the suspicion that a local counterintelligence or security service will have of you. You try to incorporate into your routine explanations for why you might be in certain places at certain times where they might come across you or why you might be at certain events where you're spotting, assessing, meeting potential future agents. Your family is all part of that. Mm -hmm. um, they sign up for it. While well, your spouse signs up for it willingly, your children don't. Uh -huh. they, you know, they have no choice. But yeah, and I, I hate to say I was like pimped out my family, but you know, uh, certainly in the case of Nick, he was um, assigned at a time when his country would often keep family members at home, sort of as hostages, so that they wouldn't defect or they would think twice about spying for a Western service or a hostile service. And uh, he really missed his, um, his, his kid. And I had uh, great rambunctious kids at home. And um, uh, our relationship started at least with him coming over to the house. And my kids were all too happy to play. And he was all too happy to get on the floor with them and play with their action figures and their dump trucks and watch their uh, teenage mutant ninja turtle movies and stuff like that. Because the relationship you're going for is intimate. Again, right. I, I can't stress that much. It has to get through all the barriers of, of somebody who comes from a country which they're expecting their best friends and family to be informers on them. So they're conspiratorial by nature. They're fatalistic by nature. If something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong. Right. We're all going to die. I mean, look at like the art of some of these cultures. I mean, it's <laughs> really dark yeah. and depressing, isn't yeah. it? And he was just like that. And he was really a poet at heart in a lot of ways. I, I, I just adored this man. But he loved coming to my family and he became part of the family. So, yeah, you absolutely do. And, and your spouse is certainly winning part of it, whether or not your spouse is in the organization. So people say you can't tell your spouse anything. It's not like true lies or whatever the difference is. Right. The movie is. Your spouse knows what you're doing. She doesn't or he doesn't know the name of your agents or, you know, what your intelligence is that you're reporting on. But if you're going out at night, they know you're going out spying. And hopefully that's what they think, that you're not going out having an affair, God knows. Right. So, you know, they're going to do what you ask them to do to, to make this person feel at home or to use their contacts in the community to try to, you know, surface people who in whom you have interest. You'll go to school events, school plays to meet people. I mean, yeah, I know it sounds terrible, doesn't it? But 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 yeah, right. You, you, you sure do that. So. That, um, I mean, Nick wasn't the only person that I recruited that way or that, you know, any case officer recruits that way. But uh, he fell in love with my kids. Uh, we got to that point of, of where he confessed and opened up about his life and his world and, and what he really did and his hopes and dreams and such like that. And I manipulated that. I leveraged it. Right. So that he would want to spy for me and the CIA to make things better. He had father issues, which I leveraged. I mean, you, you do all that. But having said all that, you know, a CIA case officer is selling a genuine product. Right. That is ideally U.S. insight to maintain stability, protect democracy, further human rights. We make lots of mistakes as a government. Sure. That's at the heart of our Constitution. That's what most Americans want to believe about ourselves. And we do it sometimes better than other times. Right. But that's what I'm selling. And it sells well when it's sincere. And I have always believed in that. So, yeah, it was not necessarily in Nick's best interest, maybe, to take risks that could lead to his death or repercussions for his family. Um, but getting Nick and others to believe they're doing it for a higher calling, because I believe in that at right. the end of the day, 
um, I, I, I stand behind still. So, right. yeah, you do use your family. They do have to go through a lot of the rough times. I mean, God knows how many times my family was evacuated because of terrorist attacks or whatever had happened. Um, but they're, they're great troops. You know, it's interesting because, and, and I think we've talked about this before with, with other people, uh, you know, from the CIA, but, <clears throat> you know, kind of popular mythology you know, our, our own cultural mythology and with movies in Hollywood, making it sexy and fun and, you know, song films, but would show like a, a, a CIA officer. I can't, I, you know, you, my wife, like you say in true lies, like, Oh, you're a spy. Like that. You can't tell your spouse what you do, but really the agency wants your spouse you, has to, you, be on you board. have to, don't you? Yeah, Isn't it your spouse that you has to know what you do. They have to be on board and they they have to be like a teammate, a willing participant, even if they're they're not getting a paycheck for it. But they have to be part of the team. They absolutely have. Uh, you know, I mean, some are more active and aggressive than others, but they all have to go through the same clearance process. Yeah, you know, because they know what you're doing. Right. Um, which is why the CIA does not allow the marriage of foreign-born spouses. They uh, they have to become U.S. citizens. You have to tender your resignation if you wanted to marry one. Uh, you've got to get permission to date one. And I'm not just talking like Russians and Chinese. I'm talking Brits, Norwegians. Right. You know, there you, you've got to get permission. And the agency does not make it easy to marry a foreign national. They make it hard on purpose and they have your resignation letter. So, yeah, your your spouse is, is part of it. And um, our spouses are amazing and they do incredible things and they make incredible sacrifices because – they have a tougher life than our foreign service colleagues do yeah. um, abroad. Uh, their spouses aren't always there when they need them there. I was in one country where my family was in the process of being evacuated because we were being invaded. <laughs> and um, I couldn't be there for my family. I couldn't help them to get you know, to the evacuation points because I was spying on the country that was trying to invade us. So um, it's, it's, it's a rough road for them, but... They sign up for it too, and and thank God for them. Now, given that that importance and and how much a, a case officer might lean on his or her family, does the CIA acknowledge that? Do they do they really champion families? Uh, and has that changed since you've been in, either for better or for worse? That's that's it's a it's a hard one to to answer. So. You know, the agency tries to be very supportive of families. It has, you know, programs and seminars and workshops and such like that. Probably much more now than uh, when I was a youngster in the service. In fact, one of my daughters got to go to a panel where um, uh, she's, she's in college right now. And these were young case officers uh, who were still in training and wanted to know what was it like to have families? What was it like for the kids from the kids' perspective? So CIA let her come into the building and she sat at this panel and, and she was articulate and brilliant and wonderful as she is because the agency does more of that these days. Um, but they can't really reward them. You know, they don't get paid right. for all this. Right. Uh, they, they don't get credit for a job. They can't put it on their, their CV. So if they've been overseas with a spouse and they couldn't work for whatever reason, um, they don't get to put in, well, I helped my husband do his SDR to be right. taken. <laughs> right. You know? Um, I, I, I made a, a target feel at home so that he was recruited. Right. So they, you know, what, but you know, what can you do for them? So right. I think the agency has gotten absolutely gotten better, but, um, there was probably also an attitude in the eighties and it was generally male case officers and female spouses where, well, you know, she's the wife. Right. And the agency was not very enlightened on women. Right. Uh, even in the eighties or the nineties and, They've still got some work to do today, but they're getting much better. So, you know, yeah, it was was a different time. On on that note, I also want to mention your uh, kids. As, as I recall, you have five children, and I believe it was your youngest put it together very early on. Dad's a spy. Been watching too many cartoons or something, and Dad leaves out the back door in the middle of the night with a satchel under his trench coat. What's going on? Dad is a spy. So, 
two of my kids figured it out really early. Uh, you're <laughs> referring to my daughter, who was probably the biggest counterintelligence challenge I had in my career. <laughs> harder than the Russians, harder than anybody else. I could deal with tracking and, and audio devices, but my daughter was really tough. Uh, but my oldest son actually was the very first one who figured it out at, a, at an early age because it was a time where we were in a very um, dangerous country. They evacuated the families, but before they did, I was the only one leaving home uh, and going out at night with, you know, as he would say, my backpack and leather jacket and running around. And he said, you know, everybody else is like armored cars and protection and whatever. So he confronted me while he was home. I was visiting because during you. their evacuation, the agency would let me come home like every three months to, to come home for a break. And one day he just said, dad, or, or, you know, do you work for the CIA? Which is like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but my daughter, I think from the time she could talk, thought I was CIA before, you know, she even knew what it was. I have no idea why. I think she watched the Spy Kids movies too many times and just absolutely <laughs> that's, that's what I did. She was looking for secret passageways in her houses and stuff. But the irony, and I love to tease her, is uh, my daughter was living at the farm with us because when I served at the farm, she and her younger sister were both kids uh, going to school and they didn't figure it out then. I mean, she was suspicious, but she never put together that we were living at a CIA base, right? which I love to tease her with. But yeah, she was tough and, and she's, she's great working a room. In fact, while I was at the farm, I would bring some of my students home for, a, for dinner and I'd say, watch how my daughter works you. She's going to work it like, a, like an event. She's going to go around the crowd. She's going to spend some time with each of you. She's going to make you feel at home. Mm -hmm. She's going to want to make you be comfortable. She's going to get you talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. She's going to make you the center of attention. I said, do that. Mm -hmm. right? She was just you know, very good at that. But the, the event you're talking about, uh, she didn't really help me that night. <laughs> it, uh, we had had a, a little function at our house. Included was a particular foreign official that I was targeting for recruitment. And uh, it was a good opportunity to get him and his family to come over because it was a family event. So bring your families, bring your spouses, bring your kids. It was a tough place to live. We were able to get access to good food, made a great meal, showed movies for the kids, had Disney on downstairs, that kind of stuff. And she pops up because she always wanted to be around, around the adults. And we're talking and she comes in the middle of a conversation where there's a few of us, including the potential target, talking about how dangerous it is and the crime and everything. And he doesn't go out at night and my little girl goes, not my daddy. Oh, he's so sweet because he doesn't want to disturb us to shop during the day. So he waits till we're all asleep and then he goes out the back door and he's got a, a, like a backpack. <laughs> this is where he gets the food groceries in and goes out at night. And uh, I never saw that guy again. <laughs> After that. So uh, that's one of those times that she didn't really help, but you know, her heart was in the right place. You know, it's funny because this is this is like the second time we've talked about kids. You know, because we talked about it with Marty Peterson, uh, who wrote oh, the Widow wow. Spy. Yeah, right. Hero. Yeah, Marty Hero. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and I mean, her book is phenomenal, and and yes, but she, but she talks about that too, especially in a day and age where. Women really weren't case off. Think of her error, yeah, yeah. 60, 70, I mean, yeah. my God. Yeah. And, and like, when is the right time to tell your kids? Because your kids can figure stuff out, but also, you know, they kids don't have filters when they're seven, when they're eight, when they're nine. Um, and for her, it was really intense where, you know, she, she tells her kids, yeah, I'm a, I'm a spy. I work for the CIA and then drives her kids to CIA headquarters. And is like, you know, I was married once before I met your father. He died in Laos, and here's his star on the wall. It's like, whoa, yeah, <laughs> this is super intense. But that that is really, I mean, it, it, no matter what job you have, right, in in America, it, there there's really not a time when you have to wonder at what point do I tell my kids? Because especially with media now, and with kid with kids, like our imaginations run wild when we're kids. So of course our parents are easily spies. <laughs> They're easily, you know, this or that when the pieces fit. And the problem is when you actually are with the CIA, the pieces do fit. Yeah, I could go either way. So I've, I've got five kids, as you said, from yeah. two different marriages, so different times of my life. Um, um, divorces are, are high in the agency. Um, 
So uh, we say in the Intel business, um, whenever you ask the question, one of the patent answers is, it depends. And it's a legit answer because it, uh, everything in espionage depends on the particular circumstances of any specific case or situation at any given time. So you tell your kids when they're ready and or when you really need to. Mm -hmm. So um, even in the case of my quizzical daughter, she was a teenager, you know, mid-teens when she found out. Uh, and I told her at that time, one, because she was ready, and we were going on an assignment where I was going to be the boss, uh, but I had people that I would come, who worked for me, who were under deep cut. And I didn't want her to accidentally associate and contaminate one of my deep cover officers with me, because since I was the boss, I was declared to the local government. They knew I was CIA I was dealing with them as the U.S. CIA representative, that kind of stuff. So it was to help her, not by outing my officers, but saying, please be aware, don't associate me with other people because you never know. So that she was aware that there were officers undercover and she had to protect them. Um, so it depends on circumstances. Are they ready? And do you really have to tell them or can you not? In the case of a couple of my kids, um, they could have been like 35 years old and would have never known and would have never mattered because they thought their father was the most career screw up they'd ever seen. I had been in the government for years and years. I wasn't an ambassador. What did I do all day? I read newspapers. I went out a lot. So I probably went out and had drinks with friends and stuff like that. Didn't contribute anything. <laughs> so then, you know, when I told him, they actually were kind of relieved. Like, really? <laughs> like, wow, you're you're a spy? We just thought you were a screw up. <laughs> so um so that was kind of good uh, uh for them. Um so two uh my, my oldest son figured it out. Um three of my uh the other four kids I had to all tell. Um the daughter you're speaking of said, I knew it all along. The other three kids were surprised, uh, relieved. My youngest, who I talk about, um, and she says she's only a joke. She asked, she continues to swear she's been as a joke. She goes, has always had trust issues. You know, what else did you lie to me about? You know, first it was Santa Claus, and now it was your career. So <laughs> what else are you not telling me, you know? Right. Am I like really a gypsy or something right, like that? Right, you right, right, right. So it's, it's, it's different, uh, but it, you, there's no like one size fits all. And you do it because you, you really do it because you need to. You don't do it for the recognition. There's, there's, there needs to be a better reason than that to tell them. I wanted to move on a little bit because, you know, you, you write your book, as you say in here, not just to relate some of these uh, interesting war stories, but you do have something to say about the CIA and the evolution you saw within that institution over 34 years, uh, some very positive things happening, but also uh, you're not entirely happy or satisfied with some of the directions the organization went in. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit, have a conversation about the uh, paramilitary mission that the CIA embarked on in a lot of instances, as opposed to the traditional strategic intelligence collection mission and sort of the dichotomy between those two things um, from your perspective. So the CIA charter uh, from 1947 is, is threefold. It's uh, collect foreign intelligence, it's analysis, and it's covert action. Uh, in the U.S. government, Traditionally, it's a CIA that conducts covert action, and covert action is different than like just spying. A lot of people spy. The military spies all the time. You know, they've got different spy agencies: Defense Intelligence Agency, Special Forces has intel elements. There's military intelligence, right? But covert action is a deniable act. Something happens somewhere: sabotage, uh, propaganda, uh, somebody blows up, whatever. Um, and it's like we didn't do it. It's deniable. There's a reason we don't want the military to do that because we don't want to put our military people in harm's way. We've got conventions, Vienna Convention, Geneva Convention. We want to respect that so the military is never suspected of those kind of things. They collect intelligence, they do it clandestinely, absolutely. But that's different than the consequences for this kind of activity. So it's done by a civilian agency, it's done by the CIA, though not to give you like a, a, a politics lesson, technically the president can assign covert action to another US agency, it never happened because the CIA is meant for its small, its agile, flatter management. We could buy foreign goods, military can't. We want to buy foreign guns, we can, the military can't, things like that. 
So it's all supposed to be in balance. Primarily, you collect secrets to inform decision making. You analyze those secrets so that you know our, our leaders can make good calls. And in select cases where there's no alternative, where the most in, best way to accomplish a U.S. security interest is a covert action program, you do it with the CIA. So those programs are supposed to be generally limited for a specific goal over a specific time frame. And the CIA is doing it because no one else could do it, right? The CIA isn't being asked to do it because they're the easy button that, you know, or they're particularly proficient in one thing or another, but it's for that deniability. 9-11, momentous time. CIA had been doing covert action since 1947. In Vietnam, we had a huge paramilitary presence. And one of the differences there was CIA's missions, while in some cases similar to the soft community's mission, um, from a cultural point of view within the agency, didn't really permeate beyond that cadre in that theater of operations. 9-11 comes and the CIA believes, CIA leadership believes, that it is facing an existential threat to its survival. You know, it's easy to look back now, uh, but at the time and having been there at the time, we thought we were either going away, at least the leaders did, or we were gonna be consumed by the Department of Defense. Donald Rumsfeld had never been a fan. And after he felt embarrassed that the agency had boots on the ground sooner than his folks could, um, 15 days after 9-11. And that was no fault of, of the community that had a lot more to do with authorities at the time and different interpretations and such like that. And the agency is really small. So for us to send a few people, we just go to like REI and buy our stuff and off you go. Mm -hmm. Where the military has to go through a process, it just it's different, which is one of the reasons why CIA does covert action in the first place. We can realign resources much quicker, our bureaucracy is smaller, our footprint is smaller. So we thought John Rumsfeld was either going to kill us or take us in, or Mueller was going to do the same. Because remember, the FBI was in the hot seat as well. They've got more of a lobby. And uh, they were able to fend off a domestic intelligence agency, which, remember, was being yeah. debated about at that time. Uh, but we thought, oh, well, they might instead, you know, pick apart CIA, divide and conquer, and grab different parts. So the leadership, I believed, um, overreacted. And they thought... What's the best way we could preserve ourselves? And you're talking about a leadership that below George Tenet at the time, it was a perfect storm of very senior CIA leaders who were very dogmatic and being very religious, being very um, American exceptionalist, but beyond just a traditional, I mean, like white elitist exceptionalism, uh, came from military backgrounds and liked the hierarchy and formal military manner, which the CIA did not have, at least the clandestine service didn't have. I mean, my first 17, 18 years, I always referred to the, the chief of the clandestine service by first name. Mm. My division chief by first name. As a first tour officer, I'd come home and see the division chief. It was like, hey, Joe, hey, Tom, whatever like that. It had become chief, sir, you know, practically saluting. So they leveraged the, the paramilitary cadre in one degree, but it wasn't really that big at the time. Remember, in 9-11, it had to grow, and it would. But they leveraged the mission and the authorities. And they leveraged covert action. So they became problem solvers for the White House. Because if you think you're facing an existential threat, who's your best friend? POTUS, the president of the United States. POTUS had some challenges. POTUS needed to get after al-Qaeda when it went to Pakistan. POTUS had thousands of enemy combatants who FBI wouldn't take because they couldn't be prosecuted. And the military wouldn't take because military lawyers said, this is not the same as like going to war with Vietnam or Korea. This is not a sovereign government. We can't take them, at least not long term. CIA said, we'll take care of these things. We'll kill the terrorists in Pakistan for you. We'll take your combatants. And more than that, we'll squeeze information out of them in ways FBI can't. So it developed, um, if you would, a path to advancement that relied on the counterterrorist mission in general, find, fix, finish as the tactic and strategy. And sadly, it was a tactic that became the strategy. Mm -hmm. So the ability to geolocate 
terrorists for removal one way or another, either kinetically or through capture activities, became the easy button because the CIA got so good at it. But it then transferred those skills in other theaters where the military was also operating, where maybe you didn't really need the CIA to do that, but you were still using them anyway because they were good and they were small and they were easier to turn around on a dime because they were smaller. Everything in the military, as you guys know, takes longer to just to do things. So that then became a leadership issue because people's careers were being advanced on counterterrorist missions, if not paramilitary, find, fix, finish, um, all these kind of CA covert action arts. And these were careers that then had not been made in the traditional intelligence field. You were getting officers who were unlike in the Vietnam era, we still had our people learning how to spy in Moscow and in China and in Cairo. Everybody was rotating through the war zones. That's fair. But now people realize I'll get promoted by sticking to this business. Mm -hmm. I'll get promoted by staying in the CA world. So they weren't getting traditional espionage experience. They weren't learning traditional counterintelligence. Even our paramilitary ops officers who are certified case officers, they go to the farm, but they don't get the experience. It's like, like me with learning how to jump out of airplanes. I jumped five times, but am I a paratrooper? Hell no, right? You get that by taking the next hundred jumps, right? Right, And, and going into exercises or real combat or whatever like that. We were taking PMOOs and making them operational leaders without understanding how this went and taking even our civilian case officers, our traditional foreign intelligence collectors who were also being rammed into like, they were in, you know, Iraq had just not Baghdad, but bases. Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, all these different places, they weren't really running traditional spy operations. So the culture changed at the agency. It became culturally um, more like the military, mm -hmm. less where people were very comfortable to challenge respectfully points of view. Because, you know, we actually teach, which is the irony of it, in the spy school. The case officer should be the first one to identify the warts. One, politically, you don't want headquarters to tell you how to manage your case. So you want to find the problems and address them. But you always have to be skeptical and question your cases. Don't fall in love with your agents, right? You always have to make sure that nothing's changed, everything's right, and anything wrong, because the case officer is trying to control as much as they can in an operation, because there's so much beyond your control. Uh -huh. So many things can go wrong. Somebody could show up at your site who you don't expect to see, who your agent doesn't expect to see. A police car could be there. There could be a bomb. God knows things that you need to think on your feet. So you try to be meticulous, plan for everything you can, and then have the wherewithal to adapt to dynamic circumstances with ambiguous information, incomplete information. Our cadre was losing all that. They were becoming very political, and they were very much now, how do I get promoted? Well, I've got to work for Jane because she's headed this program. i got to make Jane love me. So whatever Jane says, I go, you're right, Jane, Tom, brilliant, whatever like that. So we were self-censoring because rather than tell the emperor he or she had no clothes, we wanted to get promoted. Mm -hmm. We wanted the next best job. And success was this covert action, CT heavy, find, fix, finish field. That unfortunately then morphed into other problems, right? Other dominoes fall. One of those dominoes is, as I said, we're losing our, our real prowess in clandestine activity and clandestine operations. And we saw that over the years, you know, we lost a step. Other services were getting better. Uh -huh. Other services were leveraging technology better, biometrics, facial recognition, uh, city, city cameras, um, cyber, the world of cyber. We were doing it somewhat, but not very much. And not with the people who were the traditional operators who should have been the innovators in those worlds. So we were losing a step there. We also then created a culture where we could do no wrong because no one's going to stand to blame. Who took accountability for 9-11 in the CIA? Nobody. Who, who, was anybody fired for the, the, the national intelligence estimate that the Bush White House used to evade Iraq, which turned out to be untrue, that only the... Um, uh, the the um, Department of Energy and Department of State, INR, were the right ones and they dissented. What about the coast attack where seven of my colleagues died because of pitiful tradecraft? Mm -hmm. 
who put that chief of base there, who was a wonderful person and a great targeter, but never spied a day in her life. Mm. No one was accountable. Instead, we, you know, leadership circled the wagons, hid behind sources and methods. Yeah, sources and methods for the public. We don't need to air the Coast Commission report for the New York Times, but for the CIA we do, so we know what mm. went wrong and right. so that we don't promote the same people who were responsible because of not things beyond their control, but because of malfeasance, hubris, negligence. That became that circle in the wagons thing, which then perpetuated leaders who were going to be like that and mm. protecting one another. Mm. So those are the issues I try to speak to over the post 11 time, which I try to use my anecdotes to illustrate and, and sort of give the reader says, here's what spying is really about. Here's what went right. And here's where some of the things didn't go right. When I talk about the agency finding itself, after these years at a crossroads. Now I say this today, uh, and I say today now, right, or arrive, with some degree of optimism. Um, I'm very happy to see Gina Haspel leave. Um, Gina Haspel basically became an apologist for the Trump White House and shut down a lot of good operations on Russian things that she thought would get the president mad. That's unacceptable. And she kept promoting these same people. She wasn't alone, Pompeo before her, and he wasn't alone, Brennan before him. So it's not a, you know, a GOP thing. Mm -hmm. It unfortunately became an agency thing for mm -hmm. 20 years. I, I worked with Ambassador Burns. He wouldn't recognize me from Adam because it was 20 years ago, but I got great respect for him. David Cohen, the deputy director of the agency, and very importantly to me, the new director of the clandestine service, Dave Marlow, who's a good spy. He's a good old classic type, engaged with the workforce, He's not the Sir Chief type. He still has lunches with junior officers. That's kind of more of what we need. So the agency needs today find itself the crossroads to, I think, do what maybe it hasn't done yet, be accountable for its mistakes. I think maybe standing up the Havana Syndrome Task Force shows, we didn't get that right, so we're going to do this better. And they put an excellent officer on the case. The new DDO is an excellent officer. They are moving out. Some of the people I talked about in my book um, I see it publicly. They're using some technicalities like their age and no waivers for being over a certain age to stay in. And they're giving them a glide path as opposed to their comeuppance. But okay, they're at least being moved out, which I find reassuring. Uh, and some of the people moving up make a lot of sense to me. So the agency has an opportunity today to find itself at the crossroads and choose the right world to be a spy service, an elite spy service, to make sure it is so far advanced of every other spy service that it could do what it pleases around the world. I mean, that's the dream, right? But we're not quite there now, where we'll still do covert action where it makes sense, where it's not just because, well, the CIA is really good at drones. Well, so is the military. Is there a reason we should be doing deniable drone attacks? If there is, fine, I get it. But... We can't let the tactics drive our strategy. Strategy has to drive our tactics. We have to be focused on what's most important to our decision makers, which is stealing secrets from our great power competitors, from the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and North Koreans, all of whom are existential threats to us. Iran, not yet, but if God forbid they get a nuclear weapon, they could be. Russia, China, North Korea, absolutely is. They could blow up American cities. That's an existential threat. That's not you're having a bad day, That's there's no tomorrow. So this is a real new landscape for us because some people are writing about the military talks and trains, multi-domain warfare. Multi-domain warfare means the war is often won before people start shooting at each other. It's one in cyber, it's one in disinformation, it's one in space, it's one in, in, in economy. It's where, as Field Marshal Drosimov of the Russian army has said, it's his his, um, his paper from 2013, we will fight them in all measures short of war. The rules are different now. People aren't respecting the rules that we live by because we can't impose them anymore. We've got to be smarter. We've got to be sneakier. We still have got to be strong. We have to have a very strong military that could both deter and respond. But wars are going to be won before we have the, the luxury of sending the 82nd Airborne to another part of the world. Doug, so I, it, 
Please, sorry. Uh, uh, on, that, on that note, just one thing I wanted to make sure that we hit in, within this conversation. We've had a lot of conversations nationally in the last few years about influence operations, propaganda operations. Um, we've talked about them a bit here on this show as well. But you mentioned in your book specifically that you know the, the CIA has a, a, a covert influence group. They have the sort of black propaganda group that, that is supposed to handle these sorts of things. But you mentioned in your book about how they are very much deprioritized. So post 9-11, they didn't get the same resources and they didn't get the, um, the strength of personnel that they enjoyed during the years of the Cold War. Covert influence was a real key weapon in the Cold War. Um, the Russians used it. We used it. Luckily, we used it better. And, and I could say that because Poland became free, because the Europeans accepted intermediate nuclear missiles from the United States in Europe, uh, because nobody trusted the Russians, that uh, as they were trying to build up their conventional forces, that they could be trusted. So we were really good at it. I, I remember some of these programs. I thought they were just really cool. I remember a poster that uh, had pictures of Russian tanks going into Budapest in 56, in Prague in 68, and the Kabul in 79 saying, the Soviet Union, visit them before they visit you. I mean, just really kind of smart, you know, corny, but really smart things that worked and resonated. Um, when you're in charge of a program, you want that program to be sustained. You want money, you want people. What's going to get you more money from Congress? Predator porn of these amazing strikes with videos and full motion video and things blowing up or me telling you, I'm going to change hearts and minds. I can't give you a number for how many hearts and minds I've changed. But, you know, over years, right. you'll see the difference. I can't prove it. But right. so it didn't attract the best and the brightest anymore. And it wasn't getting the most resources. It was like, OK, we got to give it lip service. We got to do it some time. So I think we really devalued it and, and uh, made a mistake where the Russians and, the, you know, all, all of our adversaries, the Russians have always been good about it. It's just a very Russian thing to use this information. But our Middle Eastern partners, the Egyptians, they're really good at this kind of stuff. So, you know, we gave up on it. And I think it's, it's a really important aspect of, of the spy business that we will need in this multi-domain world where influence is key and you can't just depend on overt influence. You can't just depend on diplomacy. We need that. We need holistic approaches, strategic approaches, all tools of government working, but we need the sneaky stuff going on too. Doug, do you feel, uh, you know, aside from the sneaky stuff in terms of like the posters and, and that, that sort of, uh, you know, paper based propaganda um, do you feel that sort of the modern social media, you know, kind of viral stuff, do you feel that our own laws inhibit us in the way that, you know, our propaganda cannot affect American citizens, right, by our laws? But there's no way with social media now to control a campaign that you start in Russia or something like that from spreading back to the United States. Do you feel that our own laws inhibit that? Do you feel that our own laws should change to modernize? Or, or what? how do you see the challenge that America faces in that arena? You bring up an excellent point, and you're right. We can't place newspaper or media things and things that will come back you know, to the United States, or at least that's, that's the law. And that's got to be the intent. Some things, even before social media, would be under control, right? That's... that's um, I see it more as a technical issue. Okay. So you're right. The ability to deal with the circular nature of social media and how things go viral, but um, without getting into detail and compromising certain things, sure. there are boundaries we can use. There's also another tool that a lot of countries use, which are agents of influence, which is all part of the covert influence program. You know, I'll give you an example from a counterterrorist point of view. You want a credible religious figure to speak out against terrorism. Right. You want um, somebody in, in a government that, that is a competitor or, or, an, or an adversary to change their direction, to be less confrontational, to be more internally focused or what have you. We don't even really do that anymore. Agents of influence, other governments do. Some 
um, our famous cases, I won't mention, so I won't get anybody mad at me in the audience, but senior U.S. officials who have been recruited by foreign countries who went to jail for being agents of foreign powers because that's what they were. Mm -hmm. They were uh, access agents and influence agents and something mm -hmm. like that. So you're spot on that there are modalities, but look at the military. The military has a much bigger program. They don't call it covert influence. They don't have to. They call it PSYOPs. PSYOPs by legal charter are meant to protect American troops. Mm -hmm. So they're not meant to have covert influence to change the way of thinking or get people fighting each other there to prepare the battlefield. But it's really the same thing, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, it's, it's not deniable. So that's why the military does it. It's secret, but not deniable. But they have tremendous resources. I'm jealous of the amount of money and smart people uh -huh. and stuff that they have that they've always maintained. I mean, Special Forces has huge PSYOPs components, and I've had the pleasure to deal with them. And I'm jealous. I, I wish we had their money and, and their people. So they get around it with a different charter because they do respect the laws. And there are things you can do. We can certainly do that, too. We've got smart folks. We just have never invested in it uh -huh. since then. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to hit you with a, a few uh, audience questions, actually, Doug. Um, Jackson asks, what was your experience like with ground branch paramilitary officers and specialists? Where did you see the future of the paramilitary PMOO program headed? So to their credit, they're the bravest people I've ever met. Um, they go into harm's way. They face ridiculous risk. Uh, and, and I absolutely admire them. I, 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 what I would say about them is I don't think they're as equipped to deal with significant counterintelligence and tradecraft matters where sometimes they did have those responsibilities and things didn't go quite as well. I, I think the agency, like any service does in a combat zone, is going to have a more difficult counterintelligence environment. There's a lot more moving pieces, a lot more dynamics, and there's less tradecraft to use, you know. Case officers were standing, living behind fortresses and walls. They weren't living on the streets where their agents lived. They didn't know the territory. But I think their lack of experience was then, you know, not as embraced because they're confident folks. You know, they're like, I'm a case officer. You're a case officer. Yeah, but you went through case officer school and then you've been out, you know, conducting raids. So maybe you need a little more uh, support to make operational decisions. But they're great, dedicated Americans. They're patriots, all of them. Too many of them have lost their lives based on valor. I, I would say as a criticism, I think because they're so gung-ho that they were so eager to maintain an ops tempo, they may have taken on combat missions that I don't think were as essential for them to do. Mm -hmm. Again, what was my definition of covert action? Something that no one else but CIA could do something that you only use the CIA for as a last resort. They weren't doing that, um, and, and we lost people because of that. And they were successful tactically uh, each and every time, almost, because they were good at it. But I don't know that we should have taken on all those missions. Uh, I, I think if they were necessary, that I, I think some of them could have been taken on by our, our military colleagues. Uh, Anthony, Anthony Ash had a question above his donation. Uh, Anthony asked, the real question here is if the CIA wants a 10-year U.S. Air Force uh, TACP, JTAC, FET with a Homeland Security degree. I graduate in spring and I need a career. <laughs> so the website is very generous and, and easy to use. Uh, and I'm not being flippant or facetious. Absolutely. Uh, right in. They'll put you on a protected channel. Uh, they'll dialogue with you. They'll um, give you things to fill out uh, if, you, if you're interested. And then it, it goes from there. So, you know, by all means, do approach them. I will say that the PM cadre is getting smaller. Um, in fact, we've got more PM people than we know what to do with right now because Afghanistan was a huge place. Mm -hmm. Iraq is drawing down. So uh, we're trying to retool you know, what we can of that cadre to be able to serve more traditional assignments. But the pipeline for folks with traditional paramilitary skills is probably going to be more narrow now than it has been for quite a while. Because they're flush, you're, you're saying. Yeah, basically, yeah, to, you know, to, be, to be candid. Yeah. Uh, 
John, thank you. Uh, Groper. Pig Roper, thank you very much. And we love, you never have to apologize for giving us a, a donation <laughs> and, a, and a thumbs up, man. Jim says, uh, some view the CIA like 007 or some other spy movie characters. Other than training at the farm, do case officers ever carry a gun or engage in violence? Which reminds me uh, about um, a certain terrorist that you had to liaison with in your book. Yeah, so um, not not always, not everywhere. Uh, my luck, I've been in a lot of uh, interesting places where I did. So, um, and not war zones alone. In war zones, obviously, um, not obviously, but yes, we're armed. So war zones, we have pistols, we have, you know, assault rifles if we're going out. Um, but in um, dangerous places like cities, um, where we'll have a pistol if we need. But remember, we're spies, not soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I say that not in a derogatory way for either the military or for spies, but we're not supposed to be seen. Mm -hmm. If we're successful, we're going to pick the enemy's pocket and they're never going to know we were there. So if we have to start drawing our weapon from our hip and shooting our way out of something, uh, we probably messed up. Uh, or at least things did not go well for us because surprise, no more, right? So, yes, officers, I have had to draw my weapon. Officers have had to draw their weapon, what have you, like uh, much as I'll say. But when that happens, it's a bad thing. And it luckily happens really, really, really rarely. You talk about carrying a uh, Browning high power in your book. Oh, and God. Awful. There's one. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I like the Glock, which is the weapon we have now. Um, the Glock's nice and relatively small in, in the Glock 19. And there's a smaller one, too, that we had. But the Browning was a beast, man. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm not a gun guy, so please don't let me try to misrepresent myself. I, I'm not like an expert in guns. But I had to carry the Browning for a couple of my different assignments. And I just remember the Browning not being as reliable. Um, I remember jamming. Uh, I remember just being really big, really huge, maybe just, just the way I remember it now. Uh, and trying to conceal a Browning because, again, I'm a spy. So I'm not wearing it like outside to be shown, I did in a war zone, uh, but in like, you know, the back streets of the places I was in, you didn't want people to know you had a pistol. So you're lugging this big old damn Browning. And because none of us really trusted it, you know, we kept the safety on because the Browning, at least the Browning I remember carrying had a safety. The Glock has no external safety, right? It's just don't pull the trigger. So uh, I, it was, it was never my, my weapon of choice. I always felt a lot more comfortable with the Glock once they started issuing the Glocks. Yeah. I, and, and it's funny because people talk about double O and the whole thing with double O was the license to kill, you right, know, that, right. that was the double O. But yeah. then when you, if you meet somebody from MI6, like over in Iraq, Afghanistan, they're not even allowed to carry a weapon like that. It's against their. their That's actually true. CIA is unique uh, along with a lot of our you know European partners. We, we, we carry weapons. I'm. I'm going to ask you, I got one more kind of question for you, Doug, about uh, the sort of tail end of your career. But I just want to take two seconds just to remind people we're speaking tonight with Doug London. He's the author of The Recruiter, Spying and the Lost Art of American Intelligence. Uh, this is his memoir that just came out based on 34 years of service in the CIA as a case officer. Um, really interesting, terrific book. We uh, highly recommend it, guys. I, I think it, it, it up. make a great Christmas gift for friends or family. For yourself. Or yourself. Um, and I also just want to take uh, a moment to remind people, please subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, give us a thumbs up. Leave us some comments. Let us know how we're doing. Down in the description of this video, you will find uh, a link to our Patreon if you want to support the channel and get access to bonus episodes and segments. And there's also a link uh, to our merch if you want to get T-shirts and things like and, that. Uh, aside from Amazon and the bookstores where they can find your book, uh, is there any place they can find you, uh, Doug? Yeah, you're you're an instructor at Georgetown, a professor at Georgetown. Uh, what classes should students sign up for uh, next semester? So I teach uh, human intelligence operations this semester. Next semester, I teach writing for intelligence and alternative analysis. I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Douglas London 5. There must be four others, but Douglas London 5 is me. So um, I do make comments and news about things going around in the world. So... Uh, to, of interest to you, then please uh, take a look at my tweets. Too. So that's not Douglas London 
double O five. It's double seven five. No, no, I, I I don't rate the the double O. I just I just get <laughs> you just. It, I have a license to do travel accounting. It's as nice. To <laughs> nice. <laughs> More critical and, for the government. And and you talked about your T shirt earlier. So if there's a charity that you'd like to plug, like if you uh you know we're happy to put it on here so people. I have a special place in my heart for the New York City Fire Department. Um, I think those are like the bravest people in the world. Uh, much braver than I've ever been. And there's a lot of families still even back to 9-11. So they do sell sweatshirts and T-shirts. And if they're licensed, please buy them because that goes to the families. And, and make sure they're licensed because there are some organizations yes, out please. there that, sure are, licensed, that are less please. than reputable selling those. Yeah. Absolutely. So yes. to, to begin wrapping this up, Doug, uh, could you tell us a little bit about sort of the tail end of your career? You talk about working with someone in the book you call Alex. And it was a pretty abrasive relationship. It, it I, I don't know. I, I'll let you describe it. What, what would you like to say about that period of time? Um, it was a, it was a dark time, I think, for the agency, and I hope we're coming out of it. Uh, my chapter on Alex was originally thirty pages. The CIA turned it all down in its entirety. I resubmitted a negotiated five-page chapter, which they published to at least try to make a placeholder of the issue of which I was concerned. So Alex, um, a very, very smart person, uh, usually commands a room based on um, Alex's knowledge of people and dates and historic events. But Alex always had an agenda uh, in terms of targeting. Alex was a targeting officer who had been an analyst and from the analytic side, didn't do well there, came to the DO, Alex made uh, Alex's place uh, with some senior officers and based on expertise moved up. But Alex would tend to cherry pick and skew intelligence to suit predetermined conclusions. conclusions. And unfortunately, Alex didn't have a great reverence for humans and espionage. So um, Alex was given a particular mission towards the latter part, which we, well, that's why it became part of the latter part of my, my time in the agency where I had built up a network in my theater of operations of agents long patiently, which was getting us really good intelligence in Al-Qaeda and getting us closer and closer to Zawahiri, the, uh, the Emir of Al-Qaeda. Uh, the CIA, Gina was given basically political direction that the president wanted some big wins for an upcoming election. It was the mid-cycle of the time, 2018. Wanted headlines, wanted banners, and wanted basically you know, numbers and names, particularly names. So um, Alex was given that charter, basically took over a lot of the activities as I was leaving the department and thought the agent operations themselves were expendable. Basically, wherever we had an agent that could get, not give us an opportunity to kill somebody, regardless of their worth of value, Alex wanted that done. But the problem was that would often kill the agent or at a minimum lose our stream of reporting. So Alex was representative to me of a dynamic, which on a less insidious scale was targeting officers were given greater responsibility for making operational decisions without having a greater appreciation of sources and methods and the value of human. They didn't really think about the obligation we had to agents or to foreign partners who were running foreign agents on our behalf, mm -hmm. partner services, and would then make decisions that would be very short-term in nature with great long-term second and third order of consequences mm -hmm. to our agents, but also to our collection. So I would like to find some balance because targeting officers are fantastic. They're an amazing resource, but where they play in the decision tree, and particularly Alex, who would become a very senior officer and which could great influence, was making the wrong calls and causing a lot more harm than good. Alex also was responsible for one particular rendition of someone who would turn out to be innocent, which was in the press, if you really want to kind of sort this way through. Doug, it's a uh, incredible book. And as I was saying, uh, you know, before we started recording, I, I think a lot of people leave the agency and um, only want to write about the good things because they would like to continue working <laughs> or, and maintain their top secret clearance. Um, your book is kind of an outlier in the sense, and I admire it in the sense that, you know, you're very proud of your service there and you think the agency does uh, amazing things, but you're also not afraid to offer some of these critiques or criticisms where they're, when they're necessary. 
yeah, I made mistakes, um, and and I think that's part of operations, and that's part of growing up, and and I I wasn't always at my best, and, and I if I'm trying to take the agency leadership, and again, not the institution, but the leadership to task for a lack of accountability within itself, and I'm not talking about airing the dirty laundry to the, the public, which can get people killed, totally against leakage, linking cables and stuff like that. I've got to be honest about myself. And, sure. and I didn't always do everything right. And I, I didn't always do everything right in my personal life. I'm a flawed human being, but uh, certainly it's a time for our spy service to think, if we've got these tremendous responsibilities, we've got to be honest about ourselves as well. Well, and I think, and unfortunately, like I haven't had an opportunity to read this. Uh, Jack and I switch off every other book, or mostly. But the thing that you mentioned earlier, which was very profound, is that, you know, this isn't about a, uh, the, the agency regards how people see it. You know, this isn't a God and country thing for everybody. It is. The United States, the Constitution, represents a higher ideal. Whether or not we as human beings are always able to live up to that is, is, isn't quite relevant. But the ideals that are constitutional and what we offer to the rest of the world, not through imperialism, not through trying to convince them to be democracies, just in terms of human rights and, you know, and, and, you know liberty and things like that, that's something that we can believe in and that, you know, we can try to at least espouse those ideals. And it's like you said that, um, that, you know, these other countries that are using coercion, these other countries that are, you know, where people will be sent back to and assassin, you know, killed or whatever. Um, you know, you'd make a good point as to why the CIA isn't this monolithic thing with one type of person that all think the same, but there's a similar set of ideals that can, that can drive them. Yeah. I mean, one of the takeaways I hope people get from reading my book among them is one, I love my job. Uh, but two, the importance of the CIA, the agency, and it sounds like I'm taking steel from men in black is often our best last and only line of defense against certain threats. And you hear about the failures publicly, but the number of lives and, and wars we never fought, bombs that never went off, is because you know the men and the women of the age are out there putting their lives at risk. But with that comes a requirement for a higher standard. Mm -hmm. If we're doing something mm -hmm. that it can be unethical at times, and it is, espionage is, putting people's lives at risk is, then we've got to live up to higher standards and represent the country that we're protecting. And right. I think we've gotten off that path at times post 9-11. I'm hopeful we are back on the right path and moving in the right direction today. No, that's great. And we we really appreciate your time. Yeah. And and Doug, can I can I speaking of which, can I steal your uh, at about another 10 minutes from you, if that's okay? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, guys, again, The Recruiter by Douglas London. It's out on Amazon or wherever you guys like to go for books. Please go check it out. Next week, next Friday, we're going to have retired Sergeant Major Phil Hansen on the show, one of the original members of Delta Force. Uh, very excited to have him here and, and talk to him next Friday. So we'll see you guys then. Everyone have a good weekend. Thank you for see joining you.